step in the evolution was in so-called polymorphic viruses. So the actual body of the worm is still encrypted, just like it was with the encrypted, uh, encrypted malware. But the decryptor code can be mutated. Now, in principle, you can have a lot of different mutations, right? You could have essentially unlimited number. But in practice, uh, it's usually in the hundreds. You know, these viruses have like hundreds of different decryptors, maybe a thousand, something on that order. So they're still detectable, but there's lots more false alarms, okay? Because you have a lot of different things you need to scan for, and they're small pieces of code, right? Could show up in lots of different places. Okay. Okay, so how to detect, how to sort of efficiently detect these things? Okay, if you're getting a huge number of signatures and a huge number of false alarms, this is bad. Okay, so what might you do here? Any ideas? Uh, the key thing or one approach to doing this is uh, emulation. Okay, so you get to a point where it looks suspicious. Okay, so it's maybe one of those thousand different signatures. I don't want to give these people a false alarm. So what could I do to tell whether this is really this virus or it's just, just some innocent code? Okay, so I'll set up an emulator, okay, and I'll pretend like I'm executing the code. If it really is the virus, what's going to happen? It it's going to decrypt itself. That's like the first thing that happens. It's going to decrypt itself, and then what would I do? Then I'm good to go, right? Signature scan, okay? I can just do a standard signature scan, and I can detect this guy, okay? So emulation is kind of slow, but it's a way to reduce the number of false alarms. Again, this is why your signature scan is so slow, okay? You're doing stuff like this. Do the viruses ever say um, wait three days and then decrypt? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you can outweigh, there's lots of attacks on emulation. You can outweigh the emulator. You can do stuff that looks innocent, <laughs> right, for a long time. And the, the emulator has to give up at some point. So if you're willing to wait long enough, you can defeat the emulation. Yeah, so those, those sorts of things are done. Um, okay, that's what we say here. So anti-emulation. Uh, attacks are possible. Okay, so now you're the virus writer. You like this uh, encrypted stuff, but they detected it. You like this polymorphic approach, but they detected it. What could you do? Is there anything you could do to make it even harder to detect? Well, sort of the ultimate step in some sense, the ultimate step in this evolution um, is what they call metamorphic uh, malware. So instead of just mutating the decryptor code, mutate, if you can do that, why not just mutate the entire body of the malware? If you can do that, you don't need to worry about encryption because you've changed the code structure, and if you change it enough, there's not going to be a common signature between different copies of this code. Okay, got that? Metamorphic, okay, changing the structure of the code, all right? I like this because I got a lot of research projects in this uh, area, <laughs> so one of my favorite uh, topics. So the, uh, sometimes they call these body polymorphic because you're applying that idea of polymorphism actually to the body of the code <coughs> instead of just a you know, small piece of decryptor uh, code. Now in principle, if this is done correctly and done smart, you know, in a smart way, you could uh, evade signature detection. The idea is every time your worm mutates, it morphs, it changes its internal structure, but yet the code does the same thing, the function remains the same. If you shuffle the structure around enough, there's no common signature there for you to latch on to to detect these guys, okay? Okay, uh, Okay. so detection's difficult. How would you detect these? Okay, so Mantech just hired you. They say, okay, here's your challenge. Detect metamorphic malware. What are you gonna do? Well, isn't it odd for a program to be doing this? So you could sort of detect that um, I have something metamorphic. This is odd. I mean, the only time it does this is when it's uh, propagating. Okay, so the whole propagation thing, whether it's a virus or worm, that's a potential point where you can detect, okay, whether it's metamorphic or not. Uh, viruses, for example, tend to be... Uh, uh, parasitic, you know, they attach themselves to code. So it's very unusual for uh, a program to open an executable file to write to. And that's what a, 
virus does. Okay, so that's something you might look for, you know, things like that. Okay. But specifically the metamorphic guys, or anything you could do here to detect these? Well, if you have ideas, I'd like to hear about it because it's a good research problem. Okay, so um, we had some, I had a bunch of students work on, the, um, on this problem and problems related to it. Um, I think I'll wait till next time. I want to say a little bit uh, about some of those uh, research problems because they're kind of interesting, at least to me. Uh, how could you create a metamorphic worm? That's kind of discussed here. You can look that over. Okay, let's skip ahead to uh, fast worms, okay? So again, things like Code Red, uh, Slammer, made people think about really rapidly spreading malware. How fast could an attack occur, you know, in certain principle? Uh, okay, so people define this thing called a Warhol worm. It's, uh, it's uh, named after you know, Andy Warhol's famous quote. So the idea is, uh, could you develop a worm that could infect everybody in 15 minutes or less? Okay, that's the thinking. Uh, and it seems to be, I think people uh, uh, seem to think that the answer is yes, you probably could. Now, if you look at even uh, Slammer, which is you know, the closest thing to this that's ever actually uh, occurred, uh, we said it infected, I don't think we said 250,000. We said 75,000 in 10 minutes, but you know it used up too much bandwidth so it could not have infected uh, everybody you know, in 15 minutes. It just wasn't possible the way it worked. Now, I think we forgot to mention this, but the way that Slimer spread its infection, what did it do? It just generated random IP addresses, okay? Randomly generate an IP address, you know, go there and see if it's susceptible and try to infect it. Now you think about it, when it's, at first, there's a lot of susceptible systems out there, right? It's having success, it's infecting a bunch of sites. But what happens once they get infected? They do the same thing. They do the same thing, right? So now you've got this exponential growth, right? But they're all creating a bunch of, you know, bunch of packets and sending them out onto the network and they're clogging up the bandwidth. Okay, that's what used up all the bandwidth. Okay, so basically the point here is if you want to do something better, okay, in the sense of speed than what uh, Slammer did, you're going to have to have a smarter search strategy. You have to have a better way to search for those vulnerable sites where, rather than just randomly generating IP addresses. You can't do better than Slammer. That's basically what it did. Okay, so what can we do that's uh, smarter as far as searching for vulnerable sites? Well, you could probably think of a lot of things. Here's something maybe not too clever, but could probably actually work. Um, you could, you know, if your worm can figure out what sites are vulnerable, in principle, you could do that ahead of time too, okay? So instead of relying on your worm to do that, go out and find a bunch of sites that are vulnerable to this particular, you know, exploit that you've got, whatever, buffer overflow, whatever. Find vulnerable sites. Okay, start your worm off by sending it initially to those vulnerable sites. You know it's going to be successful on each of those guys, right? You've sort of done the work ahead of time, so you know it's successful. Okay, now how can you take advantage of that? Knowing that you're successful, say, on a hundred different sites. That's right, okay, divide up the IP address space into 100 different partitions and give each of them one one hundredth of the space to deal with, okay? It's gonna be much less bandwidth overall than if they're all trying to attack all the network. And you could conceivably even do that at the next level and the next level and so on. So it's a smarter strategy, you know, for looking for vulnerable sites instead of just blasting out to random IP addresses. Okay. Uh, people think this could probably be successful, could probably attack, you know, essentially all the vulnerable systems on the internet in as little as 15 minutes, but nobody's done anything like this, at least as of, as, as of today. Okay. Well, of course, then you have to ask, could you do better than this? Okay. In other words, is it possible to infect everybody even faster than 15 minutes? Okay. We don't want to wait 15 minutes, right? Okay, so. Uh, and that's where uh, this concept of a flash worm. Not flash on your web browser, flash as in fast. <laughs> uh, okay, so can you do better than a Warhol worm? Well, um, so can we get 
this done in less than 15 minutes. Again, the whole issue is searching for these vulnerable IP addresses. Okay, so what can we do to reduce that work? Well, okay, so here's a strategy. Um, yeah, here we go. Here's a strategy that, again, is not very clever, but might actually work. Okay, if you can find vulnerable sites, okay, you can find, you know, a few vulnerable sites, you, in theory, could find them all, right? It might take you a while, like a long time, but you can go through and scan all the IP addresses out there and look to see which are vulnerable. If you're willing to do it, you know, you could do it. Uh, and put those in, you know, and just keep a big list of those. Okay, so now I've got a list of all the vulnerable sites out there that I know my worm's going to be successful on. And so I'm just going to focus my effort on those guys and not waste my time trying to go through a bunch of random IP addresses where I know it's not going to succeed. So, okay, here's the strategy then. Take all those vulnerable IP addresses, load them into one worm, okay? It's a really big worm, okay? Go to one of those sites. You know you're going to be successful there, okay? And split the worm up and send it to two of the addresses in here. Okay, now it's smaller, okay? It's only half as big as it was. And pick, ad pick an address out of here, an address out of here. You know you're going to be successful at those locations, okay? And split the worm between those two guys and continue. If you think about it, you can't do any better than this, okay? It's basically a binary search, you know, for all the vulnerable addresses out there. Now, initially, it's pretty big. You wouldn't necessarily have to just put them all in one, right? You could start with 10 or 100 or whatever, uh, whatever made it a manageable size, but pretty quickly they get to a reasonable size, right? Because you're chopping it up into smaller and smaller. You're having it each time, right? Okay, so you really can't do any faster than this. So people have done studies on this to see how fast this could infect the internet. How fast could you do this to infect all the vulnerable sites out there? What do you think the answer is? How fast could it be? Seconds. Seconds, okay. Seconds is the right answer. Uh, it's kind of debated. Some people say as little as two seconds. Some people say as much as two minutes. But somewhere between two seconds and two minutes is thought to be the answer. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, and this was kind of all the rage amongst virus writers for quite a while, um, you know, rapid malware, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I actually saw a talk at uh, DEF CON, these, the hackers convention, um, and um, a guy was talking about this, you know, flash worms, you know, how fast they could go and all that sort of stuff. And somebody um, mentioned, in, in the talk, the person also mentioned that you could do a slow worm, right? A worm that just slowly infects a lot of sites. And then at one particular time, it does whatever bad thing it's going to do, you know, sort of at some preset time. So the infection's slow, but the effect is fast, right? And one of the hackers raises his hand and says, you know, you could do a slow worm, but, you know, it's a lot cooler to infect the entire internet in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the thinking. <clears throat> Okay, so how would you defend against an attack like this? I mean, when it's a matter of seconds, you really can't expect people to, you know, humans to respond. You'd have to have a fully automated sort of defense against this kind of thing. And there's, uh, you know, there's potential strategies for doing that, but the problem is you may ultimately just do a denial of service attack on yourself, right? You try to defend against this stuff, you're trying to sh stop infections from coming in. If it looks like an infection and it's not, you could have problems. So if anyone can even simulate an infection, you could uh, create uh, problems for yourself. So it's, it's a difficult problem um, how to defend against these things.